I thought I'd take a break from my regular schedule of lore videos to have a rather unusual video for you today, and that's to go over each of my characters. Now, in order to shoot all of the footage I use from various points within the plot of Fallout 4, I have to have a lot of characters, each of whom are in different places within the main story, or who have made different endgame decisions, locking them out of some opportunities or giving them access to others. And so I have a character who has sided with every major faction in Fallout 4. This allows me to get all of the footage I need. Sharp-eyed viewers noticed this conspicuously on display in my recent video on Piper. Some of them said that it was a bit jarring to see the sole survivor so dramatically change from shot to shot, and that was unfortunately necessary just to get the footage that I needed. But many people were asking in that video for more information about each of my characters and the choices I made for them. And so here you go. Today we're going to talk about sweets, Ox, Maybell, and Haley. Since I cover so many mods in this video, I'm gonna add it to my collection of mod musters. So mosey on over and have a seat by the campfire. This is Oxhorn's Mod Muster. We'll start with Sweets, as she was my first character. Yes, I realize it is a ridiculous name, but when I made this character, I honestly didn't expect to be playing Fallout 4 for long. At the time, I had just finished Fallout New Vegas. Fallout 4 had been released for a few months at this point. This was early 2016. I had a career doing something completely different, and I didn't expect to be playing this game for long. Boy, was I wrong. Because of this, I didn't spend very long working on her physical appearance. The very first version of Sweets had shoulder-length hair and a bit too much makeup on. Much later in my gameplay, I felt that her physical appearance didn't really match the personality of this character, and so I gave her a bit of a trim, and I removed a lot of that pre-war makeup to give her the look that she had for most of my gameplay with her. And then much later, after I had already completed the primary plot, I gave her a slight tweak, mainly just changing her hair. I've never been one to sit down and lovingly craft a backstory for my characters. Instead, I kind of just have general ideas for what their personalities are. I see Sweets as being a hardworking, loving wife and mother before the bombs dropped. She was happy to be with Nate and to raise her son, and when they were stripped from her, it utterly destroyed her world. She was really slow to recover. The first few weeks and months right out of the vault, she was a little bit dazed, still processing everything she was seeing. And for a long while, she could hardly believe that the world she grew up in and knew was gone. But slowly, over time, she came to grips with reality as she began to get to know Preston, the Minutemen, and the cast of characters she met in the Commonwealth. Her family was gone, but she still had these motherly instincts. And as General of the Minutemen, she put all of her time, love, and attention into the people of the Commonwealth. She has strong relationships with the friends around her, but never anything like what she had with Nate before the war. Instead, all of her time and passion is directed towards rebuilding the Commonwealth, one settlement at a time. Since this was my first character, her perks are a complete mishmash. I made her build up as I went along. She ended up becoming a high-powered, long-distance VATS sniper. As my first character, she's also the one whom I use to build all of my Minuteman settlements. I have way more hours on her than any other character, and so she's level 166. Because her level is so high, she has way more perks and special points than she really needs. So, it's not really useful for me to list all of her perks and all of her special points. Eventually, when I'm done with her, she'll have absolutely everything. I focused on agility, rifleman, vats, and sneak perks first before moving on to some of the others. As my Miniman General and Settlement Builder, I also worked on her charisma and the perks necessary for building settlements. Now, I wanted to side with the Minutemen with this character. However, at the time, I didn't know how. I had made some mistake during the plot of the game that forced me down the path of siding with the railroad, and by the time I realized it, it was too late. 
I had already built a ton of settlements, made a bunch of important choices. There was no way I was going to revert to a previous save. So I ended up siding with the railroad on this character, but I still think of her primarily as my Minuteman general. Because of this, on this character, I have acquired and rebuilt every single settlement in the entire game. And it was with this character that I've made a video about every single settlement in the entire game. Before I started doing Fallout lore, I focused on settlement building with this channel, so if you're interested, you can find a playlist where I explore all of the Minuteman settlements I built with this character. I'll briefly go over gear because I went over this character's gear in much greater detail in a video I published dedicated to this character about a year and a half ago. You can find that video called My Gear by clicking here. In short, even though I do use mods in my gameplay, it's still important to me that I don't give my character any advantage that she couldn't naturally get herself from the base game. So if I modify gear with mods in any way, it's primarily going to be cosmetic. It's certainly not going to give me an advantage that I couldn't otherwise find in the game. I'll link to most of the mods I talk about in this video in the description below. There are a few mods that have adult aspects to them and are not safe for work. However, they're still extremely high quality and they do have non-adult and safe for work versions of them, which is why I use them for my characters and feel comfortable endorsing them. In such cases, I won't be able to link to them in the description of this video, but I'll share the name of those mods so that you can look them up on your own at your discretion. I use a number of weapons on this character. My most powerful weapon is my VATS Enhanced Shielded Goss Rifle. This weapon dropped earlier in my gameplay and I've had it for a very long time. It was one of the reasons I ended up making this character a sniper, because it was just such a powerful weapon. It is essentially just a fully upgraded Goss Rifle with the VATS Enhanced Legendary Effect, allowing me to pull off quite a few shots on multiple enemies with one bar of AP. The downside is that the ammunition is expensive and rare. I used this gun exclusively for a long time until I began to run low on the 2mm EC. At that time, I switched to Old Reliable as my primary weapon. I love this gun. Old Reliable is a unique named lever action rifle from Far Harbor. It has the two-shot legendary effect, making it incredibly powerful. That said, even with the two-shot effect, it's almost half as powerful as my VATS enhanced Gauss rifle. But the ammunition is much more readily available. It drops all over the place on the island. I upgraded Old Reliable all the way, giving it an advanced receiver, a long ported barrel, the marksman stock, and a suppressor. Old Reliable is easy to get. You find it for sale on the merchant named Dejin inside Acadia. I love the way it looks, I love the way it sounds, I love the way it handles. It's my favorite weapon in the entire game. And lastly, I use the Shem Drown Sword, but not a whole lot as this character doesn't do a lot of melee damage. I pull it out to kill rad roaches and other vermin to save ammunition, but mainly I wear it because it looks great on my Minuteman character. I use two mods to display some of these weapons on my character. The first is called Visible Weapons by Registrator 2000, and the second is called Just Visible Holstered Weapons by Friffy. In this example, we see the Shem Drown Sword sheathed at the hip, and with visible weapons I can wear Old Reliable on my back. As for apparel, this character has a jetpack outside of power armor, which I know seems a little bit cheaty, but let me give you my reasoning here. First of all, the jetpack is available in the base game, only you have to have a suit of power armor to use it. By taking the jetpack off of the power armor and strapping it to my character's back, I don't feel like I'm cheating. If anything, I'm making my character weaker. The character loses out on all of the advanced armor from the power armor. Also, in the art of Fallout 4, we find a section on the Para Hunter. This was a raider enemy that was able to use something like a jetpack outside of power armor. Never made it into the game, but was conceptualized. My struggle here was that I needed the versatility of being able to jump from rooftop to rooftop with my sniper character, but I didn't want the clunky, cumbersome nature of power armor holding this character back. And so I opted for a jetpack mod. I use the Cross Jetpack mod by Nero. 
I did a video all about this mod, which you can watch here. It has a lot of amazing effects. You can change the jetpack's color, you can customize the flame, but this is the one that I have. Now since my character is flying from rooftop to rooftop without any power armor, I needed to find a way to not die upon dropping to the ground. Thankfully, we don't need a mod for this because we find the freefall legs in the base game. You can find the freefall legs in the mass fusion building, which again, I already did a video all about. The freefall legs prevent falling damage. Well, that is, each leg increases your resistance to falling damage by 50%. So essentially, by wearing both leg pieces, you're immune to all falling damage. These combat armor pieces have the acrobat legendary effect, but the acrobat legendary effect can drop randomly on other pieces of armor. So it is possible to create a build that gives your character an immunity to falling damage without having to use the freefall legs. You just have to be lucky. Now we'll talk about her uniform. As a non-power armor character, Ballistic Weave is really important. It is possible to get your armor factor really high using a combination of Ballistic Weave and armor. The problem is that not every outfit in the game allows you to use Ballistic Weave, and of those that do, very few of them allow you to put armor on top of them, which has always bothered me as an unnecessary restriction. For example, the standard Minuteman outfit works as a piece of armor that you can fully upgrade with ballistic weave and you can put any piece of armor on top of it. But it looks so drab. It's not an attractive outfit. I'd love to wear the general's uniform instead. It looks way better. But despite it being bulkier, which means you've got more room to put ballistic weave inside, it sadly can't be upgraded with ballistic weave. That just boggled my mind and frustrated me. And so I resorted to mods. I wanted a nice Minuteman uniform that I could upgrade with Ballistic Weave and put other armor pieces on top of. I was thrilled to find the Militia Woman outfit by The Kite in Nero. This is an extremely high quality, wonderful Minuteman inspired uniform. It can be used as an adult outfit, but it also has more modest versions, which I'm showing off here. You can alter the outfit at any armor bench to increase the length or shorten the overcoat, change its style and color, and it even comes with a unique hat, though I'm going for the traditional Minuteman hat here. With this modded outfit, I'm not getting any benefit I otherwise couldn't find in the game, I'm just changing the visual appeal of my character. On top of it, my character wears Disciples Metal Armor. As I discussed in another video, a fully upgraded suit of Disciples Metal Armor from Nuka World has the highest damage resist, both ballistic and energy, of any suit of armor in the game. That even includes Marine Combat Armor from Far Harbor. Now, if you think this costume looks silly with armor on top of it, you can always use the mod Concealed Armors by Nisas to make the armor look invisible. You're still wearing it, it's still on top of your uniform, you still get all of the bonuses from it, but it just visually looks invisible. I tend to turn these on and off sometimes. I like the idea of having my Minuteman character heavily armored, and other times I think it looks silly and bulky, and I'll turn it off. I also have a mod that improves the look of Patrolman sunglasses. I don't have any great stats from these, but the Patrolman sunglasses from the base game just look horrible in my opinion. Look at these things. They look like they were molded from clay and poorly glazed. So instead I installed a mod called Radban Eyewear Incorporated by Sade. The mod comes with a variety of Patrolman sunglass options. I'm choosing a gold and pink version for this particular character. I think it goes well. And finally, as the general of the Minutemen, this character loves her cigar. So I'm using a mod called Cigarette in Mouth to put a cigarillo in her mouth. Again, this doesn't give my character any added benefit. I just think it looks nice. Plus, I like cigars myself. On this character, I tend to run with Preston, of course. I haven't really done much to change this guy. I tried to give him the automatic laser musket that Sturgis gives us at the end of the Minutemen quest line. However, Preston never uses it. So instead, I gave him a fully upgraded laser musket and then gave him a black pair of modded Patrolman sunglasses. So there you go, that is my General of the Minutemen. I've spent 38 days, 23 hours, and 27 minutes playing this character. <laughs> oh man, looking at that makes me think, what am I doing with my life? But then I realize, oh, this is my business. I make a living doing this. Okay, I feel better about it now. <laughs> Next up is Ox. 
I made Ox just so that I could side with the Brotherhood of Steel. After I beat the game with Sweets, I wanted to complete the game and finish the story from the Brotherhood of Steel perspective just because I love their style so much. I did my best to have them look like me, but I'm happy to admit that I'm not very good at the character creation tool from Fallout 4. This is the first version of how he looked. I changed him a bit later. I gave him a beard trim and lengthened his face just a little bit. That was primarily so that he could wear a pipe in his mouth using the cigarette in mouth mod, but I have since removed the pipe. I recently revised him again, this is version 3 of Vox, trying to make him look a bit more like me, but I'm not thrilled with the results so far, so I don't know, he's still a work in progress. I don't really have a backstory for this guy. I see him as not being quite as politically savvy as some of the other characters, not necessarily wanting to go out and do evil to harm people, but also not really having the energy to care whether what he does is strictly ethical. He is very content to rise in the ranks of the Brotherhood of Steel and to see their enemies as his enemies. I do see him though as one not to spend too much time thinking about the past. He's very in the now. He doesn't think about the future too much, but he does live in the present. So even though he's sad about what happened to his family, he doesn't linger there. Therefore, he's quick to recover and to forge new relationships. Now on Ox and all of my other characters, I didn't want to do any settlement building. I didn't take any perks for settlement building. And I even went out of my way to not even meet Preston at Concord, nor to discover any workshops. So this guy is brotherhood through and through. For this character, I went with a Fudge Muppet build. I chose the Paladin Brotherhood of Steel build by Fudge Muppet. I link to it in the description of this video. It's an excellent build that really made this character a fun, big weapons, power armor character. I wanted to live and die in power armor. I didn't want there to be a moment, except for when sleeping, that I was not in power armor armor. And with the Paladin build, I was successful. I have 6 days, 11 hours, and 15 minutes logged on this character, and at the moment, he's level 90. I followed the Fudge Muppet build to the letter, until level 50. As you know from watching Fudge Muppet builds, they stop at level 50, so after that I just picked and chose perks that I thought I'd enjoy. Focusing on scrounging and putting more perks into my power armor, I wanted all levels of pain train. I also focused on perks that gave me bonuses that I didn't have to activate bonuses that I would always have access to. So I put some points into solar powered and into night person to really bump up my health, intelligence, perception, strength, and endurance. Since he's not doing much settlement building, I didn't really worry much about charisma perks, and I'm really not using vats for this character. So I pretty much ignored agility and luck. I wanted to exclusively use big guns, which was pretty hard in my early gameplay. With ammunition and weapons being rare, I ended up doing unarmed and melee damage for most of my gameplay. I then used a minigun for a while when I found one, and then when I got to Nuka World, I got my hands on Aeternus, a wonderful never-ending Gatling laser. But due to a glitch in the way that Gatling lasers work, it ended up eating through more of my fusion cores than if I just used a regular Gatling laser. So I ended up ditching Aeternus for a two-shot Gatling laser that dropped. I then simply upgraded this sucker as high as I could, and I use it as my primary weapon in the game. There is an issue with the way fusion cores work in the game. I don't know if it's something you've noticed, but it bothered the heck out of me. The game has a habit of automatically loading the fusion core with the highest charge into the Gatling laser. The problem is that every time you reload the Gatling laser, it swaps in a new fusion core. And if you're in power armor, sometimes the game is confused as to which fusion core in your inventory is being used for your power armor right now, and which one is being used as ammunition for the Gatling laser. Because of this, my inventory was filled with half-used fusion cores, completely cluttering up my ammunitions tab. To correct this issue, I installed a mod called Gatling Laser Ammo Fix by I Don't Even Know. This mod doesn't give me any bonus or any tactical advantage. All it does is create a brand new ammunition type called the PD Core. 
This PD core can only be used by a Gatling laser. PD cores are created each time a Gatling laser tries to load a fusion core. At that moment, the fusion core is destroyed and a PD core is created. It's then loaded into the Gatling laser. This way, the game is not confused trying to use the same fusion core both for power armor and a Gatling laser. In this way, I'm still able to eat through all of my fusion cores using my Gatling laser, but I consume the fusion core first before moving on to the next one, which keeps my ammunition tab nice and clutter-free. For long range, I use Death From Above, a unique missile launcher we can buy from Proctor Tegan aboard the Pridwin. This legendary unique missile launcher has the nimble legendary effect, which grants a 75% increase in movement speed while aiming down the sights. Another unique missile launcher you can get your hands on is Party Starter, sold by Cleo in Good Neighbor. This one has the Assassin's legendary effect, doing 50% more damage against humans. I fully upgraded this thing and gave it a targeting computer, which I think is essential for this weapon to be viable. The missiles move so slowly, it's very easy for someone to walk outside the range where you were shooting, but with a tactical computer, you could aim up at a cloud and the missile will rain down death upon your enemy. I love this thing so much that I went through missiles very quickly, and when I expended my missile stash, I found just how rare these missiles are, and they're expensive. So I rarely get the opportunity to use my missile launcher these days, simply because I can't keep a stocked supply of missiles. And the final weapon I use is Big Boy, a two-shot fat man that we can buy from Arturo in Diamond City. This weapon has the distinction of doing the most raw damage of any weapon in the entire game, and that's because it fires two mini-nukes with each shot. Bethesda originally intended this to have a tactical computer like the missile launcher, but they scrapped it, so sadly, we can't have these mini-nukes homing in on enemies. We have to have better aim. But thankfully, their blast radius is so huge, I often find I don't really need good aim. Even when using VATS, I could completely miss an enemy, but as long as I hit the wall behind behind them, I still destroy the enemy. Because mini-nukes are so rare, I found myself hoarding them and not using them. And then I realized, well, what's the point of even having Big Boy if I'm never gonna use it because the mini-nukes are so rare? So I've begun using this thing much more often in my videos. As for armor, I use power armor, which makes things nice and simple. As you know, when you enter a suit of power armor, the game completely ignores any damage resist, legendary, or stat bonuses you get from your armor. So it doesn't matter what your character wears. Since this is a power armor character, I decided to just use the bomber jacket and jumpsuit that comes in the vanilla game. I think the bomber jacket looks amazing, and the jumpsuit from a lore perspective I believe is supposed to have a functional purpose. It has all of these little connection points all over it that's supposed to connect to ports inside the power armor, maybe so that you can regulate your health or help inject chems. At any rate, I think it looks just fine. This jumpsuit uniform comes in three colors, the orange and cream color we're used to that you see here. It also comes in an olive color. This is only worn by Initiate Clark, so we can only get it if he dies and we loot it from his corpse during our quest with him in the airport ruins. And there's also a jet black version only worn by Paladin Brandis. We can loot this off of his corpse if he dies during the quest the Lost Patrol, or if he survives that conflict and we find him dead later during the Precipice of War, Airship Down, or Ad Victorium. The problem is that none of these versions come with the really cool bomber jacket, which is my favorite part of the outfit, so I'm gonna go ahead and go with the orange and tan version. Plus, I think this has much more character anyway. I also have the Brotherhood of Steel hood. There's sadly only one of these in the game. It's worn by Paladin Dance. The only way to get it is to get him as a companion and then to take it off of his inventory once we recruit him. Later in the game, Dance doesn't need this, as we know upon completing Blind Betrayal. But I don't know if I like it. It looks a little interesting. You don't really see my character's face very much in power armor, but I'm still trying to decide if it's something I want to go with for his final look. As for power armor, I used to use an XO one suit for this guy, but when Hellfire Power Armor came out with the Creation Club, I had to snag that suit. When fully upgraded, it does provide more damage resistance than a fully upgraded XO one suit, and it comes with its own Brotherhood paint job. 
Due to the Brotherhood's experience with the Enclave at the Adams Air Force Base, I figured that this Hellfire suit would be pretty familiar to most of the Brotherhood soldiers anyway. I liked the look of the Brotherhood of Steel paint job that came with the Hellfire power armor, but I much prefer a modded version made by Oh Dear SKR called Hellfire Redone. This mod comes with a number of other paint schemes for the power armor, including a Corvega paint scheme, even a Red Rocket gasoline paint scheme, but I installed it for its alternative Brotherhood of Steel paint scheme. I think it looks a lot better than the one we get with the Creation Club creation. That said, part of me kinda wants to go back to a T-60 suit, as the T-60 suit is more iconic of Fallout 4's Brotherhood of Steel. I haven't decided what I'm finally going to do, but I have my T-60 suit already built and assembled for if I ever decide to do that. Kate is using it right now. It's simply comprised of a fully upgraded Brotherhood of Steel T-60 right arm and left arm, the Exemplar T-60 torso piece, which grants us a 10% reduction in action point cost in VATS, even though I don't really use VATS much on this character. We get this when we complete the quest, Duty or Dishonor, but only if we convince Initiate Clark to turn himself in. I covered that story in a video, which I'll link to in the description. Vengeance, the unique T-60 right leg, which reflects 10% of melee damage received back onto the attacker. We can buy this from Proctor Teagan on the Prid one. Honor, a unique T-60 power armor left leg, which provides a bonus to action point refresh speed. We can also buy this from Proctor Teagan, but only after we're promoted to Paladin, after completing the quest Blind Betrayal. And the Visionary's T-60 helm, which increases action point refresh speed. We get this as a reward from Lancer Captain Kells after completing the quest, A Loose End. And this suit of armor just has the standard Brotherhood of Steel Sentinel paint scheme. Since this character doesn't do any settlement building, I really needed a player home. But the player home we get on the Pridwin is horrible. No workshop, hardly any containers for storage. None of the workshops on the Pridwin are connected, it's just awful. So I installed a wonderful mod by Eleonora called Faction Housing Overhaul Pridwin Quarters. This completely redoes the Pridwin Quarters, decorating it, making it look lived in and wonderful, per Eleonora fashion. And more importantly, it connects all of the workshops on the Pridwin. So anything I store in my player home, I can access from any workshop on the blimp. I love being able to go out into the blimp where the Brotherhood is living and working to fix my power armor or go to the chem station and create some chems or go to the stove and cook up some food. Really helps immerse myself in this character being a true member of the Brotherhood of Steel. As for companions, I tend to run with Kate with this character. I know Kate doesn't typically like authoritarian figures like the Brotherhood of Steel, but after completing her personal quest and learning of her desire to clean herself up, I feel like she needs a good supportive community to be around that can help keep her accountable. And so on this character, she spends a lot of time with the Brotherhood of Steel. I gave Kate my Aeternus, you can see in her inventory, the fusion core problem that this gun creates, and underneath, she, like Ox, wears a bomber's jacket. Next up is Maybell. I was watching the Pirates of Penzance while creating this character, hence the name, and I made her to be my evil institute character. I originally created her to look dowdy and unapproachable, maybe even a little bit emo. In her second version, I only changed her hair a little bit. I tied it back to be a bit more practical, and I grayed it a bit more. The grief of what she's suffered through is starting to set in. And in her final version, I really tried to make her look a little bit more snake-like. By this time, she's a high-ranking official in the Institute. But the power's going a little bit to her head, so she gives herself a flashy haircut and gets rid of the gray by dyeing it jet black and lacking self-confidence, perhaps intimidated by the success of her son, not feeling like she really deserves the power that she's been given. She permanently wears a snarl on her face to keep everyone away, preventing anyone from getting close to her so that no one will observe and realize that she doesn't deserve to be where she's at. That's her fear anyway. After having played my Brotherhood character for a time, I fell in love with Power Armor, and I knew that I wanted this character to be a Power Armor character too. Even though no one in the Institute uses Power Armor, the best faction Power Armor paint in the game 
is the Institute one, so surely someone in the Institute must use power armor if they've developed a paint scheme for the X01. So I figured it would be okay to go with power armor for this character. Aside from that, I didn't really know what to do with this character when I made her. Automatron had just been released when I made this character, and so I started by using the Fudge Muppet Mechanist build, which is a great power armor build that focuses on mastering robots. I used this faithfully for a long time while building this character, only to discover that I wasn't terribly keen on having robot companions. I had Codsworth for a while. I wasn't really interested in having Curie as a companion for this character. Ada is just bland after you finish the quests in Automatron, and all of the Automatron robot companions lacked personality. So around level 30 or so, I started swapping in and out perks that focused less on robotics and more on making my character a better commando spec character. The thing I like most about the Mechanist build is its focus on automatic weapons. That was one gameplay style I hadn't done yet until this point. I had only done snipers and big weapon characters, and I have to admit, this character is one of my most favorite characters to play. I love commando, I love the automatic weapons, and I love the variety of choices available in Fallout 4 for all of these automatic weapons. The big struggle, of course, is ammunition. You go through it so quickly using an automatic weapon that I found myself collecting at least one automatic weapon of every ammunition type just to make sure I had something on hand in case I ran out. Which, over the course of the 74 levels, 5 days, 11 hours, and 24 minutes I've been playing this character, has happened quite a lot. Though it happened more frequently in the earlier parts of the game. Later on, after fully specking into Scrounger and looting more end-of-dungeon steamer trunks, ammunition is less of a concern these days. There's no one automatic weapon that's my go-to weapon on this character. I tend to cycle through a variety of them. Overseer's Guardian, of course, was a really important one. The ammunition is plentiful, and it's a two-shot weapon. We can buy Overseer's Guardian from the merchant Alexis Combs in Vault 81. I managed to find an assault rifle with the two-shot legendary effect. This gave me a wonderful weapon to use with the 5.56 ammunition type. It's probably one of my favorite weapons to use just from the look and feel of the gun. But as it was a random drop, I can't tell you where to get this thing. I just got lucky. I also enjoy the Problem Solver, a unique weapon we get from the Nuka World DLC. It's a tricky one to get. Many people may not get it unless they know it's there. We can only get this weapon by talking with Mason while completing the quest An Ambitious Plan. To get the gun, we have to choose all of the right-hand set of dialogue options throughout the entire conversation, constantly bullying this guy and being aggressive towards him. Towards the end, we find a charisma check that we have to pass, and if we successfully pass it, he gifts to us the Problem Solver. It's a powerful weapon that has the Furious Legendary effect, which increases damage after each consecutive hit on the same target. So as you can see, this is a very useful weapon to use for a commando build. However, I'm not terribly keen on the sound that it makes. It feels a little clunky when using it, and the ammunition is very rare. You only find it in Nuka World. And it doesn't drop on any of the monsters in Nuka World. It only drops on people who wield guns in Nuka World, which happens to be raiders. So if you side with the raiders and you're not killing a bunch of them, you find fewer opportunities to get this ammunition. You see the problem here? So nice little gun. I keep it in my rotation, but it's not really an everyday weapon. Then I use the Wazer Wifle. It has the unlimited ammunition capacity legendary effect. We are gifted this by someone very close to us at the end of the game. I really enjoy using it, but it does burn through ammunition pretty quickly. I also use Experiment 18A, which we can buy from the Synth Requisition Officer inside the Institute. This weapon has the Rapid Legendary Effect, which gives it a 25% faster rate of fire and a 15% faster reload speed, which as you can imagine is wonderful if you turn this into an automatic weapon. But again, plasma ammunition is incredibly rare. I spent almost all my spare money just trying to find this kind of ammunition. So I rarely use this gun, it's just too expensive to use in everyday combat. And the final weapon I really enjoy playing with is the Radium Rifle. I managed to find a relentless powerful automatic Radium Rifle, and against enemies that are not immune to radiation, it is 
deadly. That 100 radiation damage just tears raiders to pieces. It uses 45 caliber ammunition, the same as the Overseer's Guardian, but I don't know, for some reason I like the look, the feel, the weight, and the sound that this thing makes a whole lot. So I'm tempted to shelve my Overseer's Guardian in exchange for the Radium Rifle, even though I think it may make me weaker. The double shot effect of the Overseer's Guardian works against everyone. The radiation effect on the Radium Rifle only works against characters that are not immune or resistant to radiation. My ultimate plan with this character is to get Radical Conversion once I take this character to Far Harbor. She hasn't been there yet. Radical Conversion ignores 30% of the target's damage and energy resistance, which I think would make using Radical Conversion a much better choice compared to Overseer's Guardian. Another great, unique radium rifle is the Kiloton Radium Rifle from Far Harbor, which has the same effect as Spray and Pray. Bullets explode on impact, doing 15 points of area effect damage. I enjoy using weapons that have that legendary effect, but it's really easy to kill people you don't intend to, like settlers or caravanners turning entire cities hostile, so I tend to avoid guns like that. As for armor, she uses a full suit of X01 power armor. I suppose I could use the Hellfire power armor, but I don't know, for some reason I feel like the X01 has more of an institute feel, even though I know it is enclave armor, but well, never mind. I just use a fully upgraded suit of X01, and I use the Institute Paint Scheme. The only mod I use to improve the Institute Paint Scheme fixes a bug in the vanilla Institute Paint Scheme. I don't know if you've noticed it. In the vanilla game, you see that big square patch of missing paint on the snout? It's always bothered me. It's there even on console versions of the game, and it's just a Bethesda bug. I use a mod called Power Armor's Redone by Nukanist to fix this bug. So now, the snout of my Institute Power Armor is perfect. Now again, since this character is in Power Armor, it doesn't really matter what she wears underneath, as all of the damage resist and bonuses from her armor is gonna be completely ignored. So I felt free to really use any mod for her. Now we do get a really nice lab coat once we complete the storyline with the Institute, but I don't feel like this is a great outfit for using out in the field. It's a great costume to use when working as a scientist in the Institute, but for going on field missions, eh, not so much. So then there is the courser uniform, but my character isn't really a courser. She's a higher rank than a courser, so it wouldn't make sense for her to use a courser uniform. Also, for some reason, I've never been too terribly keen on the courser uniform. It's okay, but it's not my favorite. For a time, I enjoyed using a basic synth uniform, but after a while, I began to think that it didn't really fit her character. This is, after all, my evil playthrough. I've imagined that she's become more insecure and vain as time's gone on. I wanted something that could be used out in the field, but that also clearly demonstrated her high rank. I found the perfect costume with a mod called Healthcare Division Synth Uniform by The Kite in Nero. Again, this costume does have very adult versions, and the mod download page is not safe for work. But thankfully, it's a modular costume, and you can find more modest versions using an armor workbench. I was able to create a version of this costume that I thought fit my character's personality much better. It looks great, it looks like something a high-ranking Institute official would wear, and the attention to detail and ending quality of this costume is superb. This costume does come with high heels, which I'm not sure how that would work in power armor. So I went ahead and gave Maybelle some boots from a mod called Pompous Set, a mod that also has some adult options, but also some more modest ones. Now, when I've used this character in the past in some of my videos, people frequently complained about her face, possibly not realizing that I purposefully made her to look like a snake because she's my evil character. And since it's so distracting, I decided to get a surgical mask and some goggles <laughs> to complete her look. I looked and looked, and I couldn't find an Institute player home that I really liked. There were some great ones out there, but none that really seemed to fit my character here. And so instead, I installed a mod called AS Institute Workstations by Dubot. This mod adds workshop building to the entirety of the Institute and adds crafting workstations to certain places in the Institute which of course was missing in the vanilla version of the game. How are you supposed to use a player home if you can't do any crafting in the Institute? 
With this mod, I can now use the whole institute as my player home and then decorate my personal quarters using the institute's workshop. But I haven't actually done it yet. <laughs> this is what my player home in the institute looks like right now. I've made a little progress. I've got a divider near to my bed and a few containers set out, but it's not nearly done. I just haven't had time to sit down and finish this player home, so I will get to it and when I'm done, I'll be sure to share it with you. As a companion, of course I use X688. I realize that some viewers think he's boring, but for my character, he's perfect. He's not a real person in her mind. She sees him as a slave or servant, definitely a machine, and being a little self-conscious, shy, and intimidated by the successes of the scientists that surround her, she feels much more comfortable spending her time with someone whom she doesn't believe is really a person. I kept X6 in his standard coarser uniform beneath a full suit of Institute painted X01 power armor, and I replaced his ugly patrolman sunglasses with a pair of modded ones. As for weapons, I've tried giving him a number of automatic weapons, but he always prefers to use an Institute one, so I figured I'd just keep him with his basic Institute automatic rifle. And finally, we've got Haley. Haley was originally supposed to be a man. I sat down to create a new railroad character, and I figured another man would even out all of my characters, two women and two men. However, I created this character during a live stream, and so I took a vote. The viewers voted that she be a woman, so I made her a woman, and they voted on her name. They named her Haley. I haven't devoted too much time thinking about Haley's backstory. I can say that she's not quite as fanatical about rescuing synths as the rest of her railroad comrades. She still agrees with them that synths are people and she wants to free the synths, but not more than anyone else. She doesn't hold synths above other humans. Instead, she sees evil for what it is and she thinks the Institute is evil and she sees the railroad as a welcome ally for fighting the Institute. She also likes the Minuteman, but this particular character prefers the methods the railroad employs to fight the Institute. She wants to use small numbers of talented people who are good at infiltration to achieve her ultimate goal of destroying the Institute, rather than building a brand new militia from scratch like the Minutemen do. To get the look I wanted on this character, I used two mods. Lots more female hairstyles by RBDDC12 to get the hairstyle that I wanted, and more skin colors by a cacophony to get the skin shade that I wanted. I then went through two different face sculpts until I was finally satisfied with her look. Even though my first character did side with the railroad, I played her as a Minuteman character. And so for this character, I really wanted to get that railroad experience. And so I used the Fudge Muppet Assassin's character build. I had never done melee in a game like this before, and I really wanted the melee experience. And it was very hard. There's a reason I have not done melee before, and that's because, I don't know, for some reason, it was hard for me to play a melee character. The first 30 levels of this character were agony, but as I leveled her up and she became a little bit more powerful, things got a little easier. Things are now much easier with the higher ranks of Blitz and all of the perks necessary to make sneak criticals one-hit kills. Now this is my youngest character. She's only level 33. I only have one day, 22 hours, and 44 minutes invested in her. So she's not done yet. I therefore haven't found her endgame gear. But I'll show you what I've got and where I plan on taking her. For a time, I tried exclusively using melee with this character, only to find so many situations where I wish I had a gun. So I finally relented and got two guns for this character. I of course use the Deliverer for my primary stealth assassination gun. This is the 10mm weapon we get from the switchboard upon completing the railroad quest, Tradecraft. For a longer range sniper rifle, I use Overseer's Guardian. And for my assassin's melee weapon, I'm currently using Pikmin's Blade, which of course we get from Pikmin. Ultimately, I want to get the Throat Slicer Disciples Blade from Nuka World. This is sold by Caitlin Alden in the Nuka Town Marketplace. I suppose I could go get it now. I just haven't bothered to do so yet. The Throat Slicer, like Pikmin's Blade, has the bleeding effect, but the weapon itself is much more powerful. So I will be upgrading to that eventually. Like my Miniman character, I don't plan to use power armor with my Railroad Assassin. 
I suppose I could use a T-51 suit with the railroad paint scheme on it and all of the power armor mods that improve sneaking. It's just that part of me thinks it's ridiculous to have a stealthy sneak assassin in a full suit of power armor. So I'm not gonna wear power armor with this character, which presented me with a similar problem that I had with sweets. That is, I needed a costume that would make sense for this assassin character, but that also provided me the benefits that I needed. Okay, so we have a couple of options. I can wear a full suit of combat armor or even some marine combat armor to get the highest damage resist possible, sure. But would an assassin really be wearing something quite so bulky? There are the costumes that the railroad gives us themselves upon completing their quests, including the covert sweater vest, which to me is ridiculous. No one in the wasteland wears a dress shirt, a sweater vest, and slacks, unless you're a spy. <laughs> Like, if you want to stand out as a spy in the wasteland, you wear the covert sweater vest. That's how you signal to the world, hey everybody, I'm a spy. So that didn't make sense to me either. I could pull a deacon and just wear dirty rags or a wastelander outfit or a DC guard uniform if I'm in Diamond City, but I don't really see my sole survivor as a railroad character being that sort of espionage character. Instead, I see her being a heavy like Glory. So what does Glory wear? Well, she wears that railroad armored coat. The problem with the railroad armored coat is it does not accept ballistic weave and it takes up way too many armor slots. Plus it doesn't look very good. It's a leather jacket with a bunch of metal shoved in it. Now I could use the Chinese stealth armor from the Creation Club. The problem is that it doesn't accept ballistic weave. And one could argue that having a permanent stealth field while also getting all the levels of ballistic weave might be a little bit OP. So to find what I needed, I had to resort to mods. And I found the perfect mod, which was just made public recently. For my railroad assassin, I use the Handmaiden outfit by The Kite and Nero. This exceptionally high quality costume is modular like the others, and so it does have some adult versions. But thankfully it has much more modest options as well, and they look great. It looks a little film noir, which I think gives it some versatility. Who knows, maybe you'll want to dress Nick Valentine in this. And by the way, this does work for male characters as well. The others I mentioned only worked on female characters, but this one has a version for both men and women. And it comes in a variety of colors, tan, green, purple. Right now you see me using the black and gray outfit colors, because I think that fits better in with a sneaky railroad character. And here's my favorite bit. The railroad lantern that you carry around is interactive. You can turn it on and off by turning on and off the light of your Pip-Boy. So for now, I'm using this costume with my stealthy assassin. She's only level 33, which means right now I only have the first rank of ballistic weave, so she's still a bit squishy. But hopefully as I continue to play her, she'll become much more powerful. Again, I don't do any settlement building on this character, so I needed a player home, and I wanted it in the railroad headquarters. Glory and everyone else seems to make the headquarters their home. Why can't we? I use Eleonora's Faction Housing Overhaul Railroad Headquarters, which gives us a nice nook by the stairs that's expertly decorated. For a time, I considered rolling with Deacon as a companion on this character, but he just got into way too much trouble, and I realized that you just can't roll with a companion while also trying to be a stealthy assassin. So, Haley runs solo. And there you have it! Those are the four characters I used to shoot footage in Fallout 4. I do have a fifth character. I named her Witchy. She sided with the Minutemen. I created her just to see the Minuteman ending, but I don't use her to shoot footage and I really don't play her all that often. I used the Silver Shroud build by Fudge Muppet for this character, so she also is a Commando build. And at the moment I have more fun playing my Institute character Commando build. Thanks for watching, ladies and gents. If you're interested in the mods that I talked about in this video, I link to most of them below, as well as to the Fudge Muppet character builds that I used for all of my characters. I also released my own mod, giving you the look menu presets for all of these characters. So if you want to rip the face off of any of the characters I showed off in this video and put them in your own game, you're more than welcome to. Well, I had a lot of fun putting this video together for you guys. I haven't really done a mod overview in quite some time. So let me know what you thought in the comment section below. It's been a long week for me. I published a lot of really long, detailed content this week. So 
I'm going to head on out and enjoy my Sunday. I hope you guys have a wonderful and relaxed weekend as well. Since I'm taking Sunday off, I'm not going to have a video for you on Monday, but never fear, I'll be back Tuesday morning with a brand new video. I've got a new shirt in the shop, folks. Lawbringer. When we zap an enemy with a laser weapon in Fallout 3, we turn them into a big pile of glowing ash. But if we have the Lawbringer perk, we inexplicably find a severed finger resting on top of the pile. This shirt celebrates that fact, as does its companion. Tap that ash. Or if you don't like the text on either shirt, you can find a version with just the image by itself. As well as a bunch of other shirts and goodies, you can find a link to my shop in the description below, or you can click here. If you like what I do and you want to support me in a more personal way, consider becoming one of my patrons on Patreon. But more than anything, I'm just so glad you're here watching this video with me today. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you Tuesday morning, bright and early, with a brand new video.